Awesome. Well, it's 3.30. Welcome, everyone, uh, to the Grains for Brewing and Distilling Happy Hour. Um, this week, we're going to be talking about making malting grade with your barley or whatever grain happens to be that you would like to get into a malt house. Um, so our guests this week are Mr. Christian Kapp from Michigan State University Upper Peninsula Research and Extension Center, or UPREC, as we'll call that uh, from now on, because it's a lot easier. Um, <clears throat> I have some things prepared to say about uh, setting yourself up for success um, as a grower looking to get your grain into a malt house. Um, first and foremost, have a buyer before planting anything. Um, written contracts are always encouraged. Um, I, just so everyone knows what the expectations are and everyone can hold each other accountable. And hopefully it's a way to communicate better what your expectations are. Um, <clears throat> so that ugh, thing there is who, what, when, where, why, and how. So who is pretty obvious, but what is a little more complex. So what pertains to the grain? Yes, that you're growing for the malt house, but what condition is it going to be in when you deliver it? Um, <clears throat> what, if any, foreign grains, materials, beards, anything chaff <clears throat> is acceptable and, and in what quantities because um, it's it's unavoidable but cleaning your grain um, before malting is imperative so who's going to do that cleaning is that something that falls onto the grower or is that um, something that's going to be handled by an intermediary between the grower and the malt house or is that going to be taken care of by the malt house um, how is it going to be delivered? So is it going to be put into super sacks? Um, is it bulk delivery into a grain bin? Everybody wants that, um, but it's not always achievable with a small business. Um, <clears throat> so that's a, the that's a best case scenario for everyone for sure. But um, super sacks for craft malsters um, are by, by and by um, much more common than bulk delivery. Um, <clears throat> when will delivery take place? Um, usually that happens after you submit a sample, it gets analyzed and it's either accepted or rejected, but how long or soon after acceptance or rejection um, does delivery take place? Um, and then again, how is that delivery going to take place? Um, there's a lot, no matter how, how much preparation you engage in and how many questions are asked and answered, there's always things that come up that you just didn't think of. So having those lines of communication open are, um, is the most important part um, in life, but also in malting. Um, <clears throat> so choose a variety that the buyer recommends, the buyer being the maltster, um, or if you're lucky enough to be growing for a baker, distiller, or any, any end user, um, you know, what do they want? And then you choose a variety that they recommend because likely they're going to recommend something that's been successful for them. Um, it may be something that's a little newer um, but and maybe unproven, but if they're committed to buying it, then that's that gives you a little more security. Um, so growing something now at this point like Conlon um, without a contract is pretty risky, um, but if you're planting Odyssey or Calypso or Violetta and you have an agreement with a maltster or a buyer um, at, the, at harvest time, that's going to take that from you. And that's, that's where you want to be. Um, plant certified seed, um, treat it as well. That stops the spread of uh, seed borne disease. I know that gets kind of sticky if, um, if you're trying to go for certified organic um, or you have other cultural practices in place that don't um, really jibe well with seed treatment, but it really helps. Um, and then certified seed to, mean, to guarantee purity um, and that everything uh, is as it should be. Um, <clears throat> have a fungicide application plan. So minimum one treatment of fungicide for fusarium. Um, <clears throat> and then if you're growing spring barley, we haven't, I don't think we've noticed it so much with winter barley, if at all. But cereal leaf beetle um, loves spring barley and um, having an insecticide plan to treat for cereal leaf, be cereal leaf beetle um, is probably something that's going to be um, going to be relevant to you if you're growing spring barley. So check in throughout the growing season. Um, you know, if 
you know, March through August passes and you haven't heard from the maltster, haven't spoken to them at all, things change for small business people. And um, I used to love going out and visiting farms and talking to farmers during the season. Um, it gave me an excuse to get out of the malt house and get out in the field. Um, so most of the time they, they want to hear from you if you're a grower and vice versa. Growers really appreciate it when maltsters get out there and check in and, and everything. And, and it's really enjoyable. I recommend it. Um, <clears throat> so when are you going to harvest? Um, are you going to harvest at high moisture and dry down? Um, if you're going to dry down no more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, um, if you're applying heat to dry it down, um, or are you going to wait until it dries in the field? Uh, well, that's in some areas and depending on the weather, that's taking your chances, but being dry in the field sometimes means that you're less likely to have beards or awns adhering to your barley when you combine. So that's maybe a good thing, but you're running the risk of having it shattering if it's too dry, the hell head could shatter and you might lose some. Um, so there's um, bonuses and, and negative things to both strategies. Um, but I think, and what we're seeing down in Ohio and Indiana, and I think for Michigan, um, if you're doing things right and you harvest out a little high moisture and dry down um, reasonably low heat, I think you have a good chance uh, for success there. Um, other than gambling with waiting until it dries in the field, but uh, your mileage may vary. Um, and then with a high moisture harvest and dry down, you might have problem getting the beards off too. So you might want to run it through a debearder at that point. Um, but every field's different, every barley is different. So as far as moisture goes, 13 and percent moisture is the standard as far as market goes. So um, you shouldn't be dinged for trying to sell the maltster water if it's at 13 and percent. But if you're looking at long-term storage in our climate, given our average seasonal temperatures and relative humidity, 12% is really where you wanna be for long-term storage to maintain viability in the bin or super sack. Super sacks are so risky for long-term storage. Um, not just for moisture and grass, but for pests and everything, they're kind of problematic. Um, so when you submit a sample to the maltster, or um, if you're sending it directly to a lab yourself, um, like up to Christian at, at Upper Act or one of the other labs um, that provides raw grain analysis, sampling is really crucial. Um, so I've, got, I've requested second samples before from growers, you know, like, I don't want to reject this barley, send me another sample, you know, how did you take the sample? And it, it um, if, you can take it while it's moving at timed intervals. That's going to give you a good representation usually of the entire lot of barley instead of just one point. Um, if you're not able to take it while it's moving, um, taking it from multiple points, like in that combine um, bin picture up there, like if you're able to get down in there with a piece of PVC or if you have a grain trigger, which most people don't, but um, there's a specific like, spike that's used for grain sampling and it's a little nifty and they're kind of pricey but i've always wanted one um <laughs> that you can grab like essentially core samples from different points in that container of grain and uh, you can even go diagonally and horizontally um, but the key is to get an accurate representation of the entire harvest um, down into this one kilogram or three or four pounds at the most sample that you're sending into the lab um, and that's going to give you an accurate, hopefully an accurate representation. If you're just taking some off the top or taking some from the bottom of the bin, it's not going to be indicative of what's going on in, in that whole bulk of the mass of grain there. And then who owns that COA? So if you submit your sample to a malt house and then they pay lab fees, um, for raw grain analysis, and then they make a decision based on that. So. I would, if I had to reject grain, I would always let the grower have the certificate of analysis. Also, if I accepted, but they didn't really, you know, they weren't concerned about having it at that point. They just wanted to get paid, um, <clears throat> which is fine. Uh, but if I would reject, I would send them the certificate of analysis and say, here, you know, it's, you might not have much luck with the maltster down the road, but at least you have this to present your product in an accurate manner. And that's, um, that's I think, I think that's important. Um, I don't know if every maltster is going to do that for you, but 
a lot of growers I know, at least in Michigan, submit their own samples so they have an accurate idea of what the quality of their grain is before they start shopping it around to different buyers. Um, and it's it's a good system of checks and balances. Um, it's, I think, like no more than 50 bucks. Um, I haven't checked lab fees recently, but Chris can talk to that too. Um, but it's it's well worth it, especially if, if you have a significant amount of grain um, that you're trying to sell. And then also if you can't sell it and have to store it long-term and try and sell it out over the course of, God forbid, four to five years, <laughs> and you're keeping it in sound malting quality, um, you're gonna wanna have it analyzed um, regularly. And I know a, a, a person down uh, in Croswell that's had like six row that's like awesome quality and it still has retained its, <clears throat> its uh, viability for malting. And I believe it's from 2015 and six row and nobody wants it and it's kind of sad, but he has it tested regularly and um, he's keeping it in good condition. Um, but yes, um, so a certificate of analysis for the grower and the person who's actually selling the grain directly is uh, something that puts you in a, in a much better position to sell um, than just relying on the word of the buyer because the buyer is at the advantage if the grower doesn't have the COA, right? Um, but enough about that dynamic. <laughs> so what do you mean there's mold in the crease? That old chestnut. <clears throat> um, so I should really have cited Steve uh, Edwardson from the North Dakota um, Barley Council on this because that's that's his like anecdote. His story is that um, growers on a really good year would have like great barley, and um, <clears throat> of course the mulchers were full up, and they you know bought the best barley and were. <clears throat> um, fully stocked, so they'd see more loads come in and say, "Well." You know, it's it's good barley, but there's mold in the crease. I can't buy it. I'm like, what do you mean there's mold in the crease? See right there, there's mold in the crease. And they, you know, hem and haw and, and go back and forth with it. But saying there's mold in the crease is is entirely subjective. Like, what what do you see there that's mold? Are they little black specks? I went out, I'm not a mycologist. Um, and probably neither were those folks. Anyway, <clears throat> so it's a good way to kind of be dismissive and just say like, well, we bought too much barley and we don't, we can't buy this right now, even though it's good. So <clears throat> um, the quality thresholds need to be in the contract and clearly stated and agreed upon. And if you have any questions as, as to what those mean as a grower, definitely talk to the monster about that. Um, you know, foreign materials um, aren't created equal. so. If it's 5% hairy vetch seeds, is it the same as 5% um, like straw pieces and broken kernels? No. So being transparent, communicating clearly about the what, what the quality expectations are is very important. Um, so moisture, again, you know, market standard for wheat and barley is 13 and a half, but you know, that's not a good standard to hold to in our climate. <clears throat> um, so 12% is way more better, excuse me. <clears throat> and I know that's improper grammar, but hopefully you'll remember that <clears throat> by that uh, fun phrase to say, way more better. So Don, deoxygen of alanol, that's what we're um, assessing fusarium head blight contamination by, that's below one PPM. Um, that's based on an FDA guideline for wheat, um, but that's been transferred transfer it over into a rule for malting barley. Um, I would show preference to 0.5 ppm or below. Um, so if all barley in a given harvest year was passing quality and I had the choice between um, 0.5 or 0.4 ppm and one ppm barley and everything else were equal, I would of course go for the lower um, content of Don because there's, um, there's a chance that during the malting process, if things aren't being controlled very tightly, that fusarium can actually begin to grow in the malting process. So the lower your Don content, the lower um, fungal spores from fusarium are present, uh, the lower quantity that are present, the lower risk of it um, coming out as finished malt with Don in it. Um, so germinative energy, which is um, basically the viability of the seeds themselves um, without hydrogen peroxide. So just kind of as they are um, in four milliliters of water after three days, as we can see in that um, 
that photo from Hartwick College of like little plates on, on tissue paper. Those are Wattman number one filter papers. They're very expensive. Um, needs to be over 98%. Um, and these are AMBA guidelines, uh, American Malt and Barley Association guidelines. So as a craft maltster, and you might be working with one or two growers or more, um, but depending on the year, you might be more incentivized to budge on some of these parameters. And germinative energy were one of the things that I sometimes had to budge on when I was in a malt house. And sometimes I paid the price on that, but getting down to 95% um, was kind of pushing it. Um, so anytime you compromise on that, the, those germination numbers, it's gonna be reflected in the quality of your malt um, later on. Um, but that'll be a topic for actually the next um, happy hour session. So plumps um, on the 664 screen. So we've got these little notches. There's 664 of an inch. Um, and into anything retained on that screen, anything bigger than that notch um, is uh, should be above 90% of your weight uh, in a given sample should be um, plumper than 664. And then protein generally um, at or below 12% for all malt brewing and distilling. Um, but again, if you're a craft maltster, you don't necessarily have the means to store all these different protein level barleys. You can't necessarily blend um, to get what you want in protein. And even if you could, um, everything else is different too. So it becomes too many moving parts for blending. Um, so what I would wanna see in the malt house is I would really want 10 and a half to 11% because then I would be pretty confident that I could get a pale malt um, with low flavor. Um, I know that sounds like a bad thing, but in like a pills or pale base malt, you don't want too much flavor. Um, and you definitely don't want too much color. Um, but if I, through kilning basically, and, and also through the germination process, if I were able to um, <clears throat> take that and manipulate it, I could get like a Munich with higher color and higher flavor out of it at that 10 and a half, 11% protein level. Um, right at 12%, it's gonna be easy to get dark flavorful malt from that but it's going to be kind of hard to really get uh like a really really like nearly colorless pilsner malt um with like proper flavor profile and everything um but i digress rva rapid visco analysis so it's uh essentially a stirring apparatus that you um grind up barley and i think we've got a video from christian too where he explains that process um that will play and um so it spits out rapid visco units. So it spits out a unit of analysis that's in, in like titled by itself. So yeah, call it how you want, but basically it's a stirring number. So anything above 120 um, is pretty sound and there's no sprout activity. And that's what this stirring process is indicative of. So <clears throat> it's stirring this barley slurry and it's timing how long it takes for it to uh, become more watery essentially. And that's indicative of enzymatic activity due to sprouting. Um, so what that does is that tells you how stable this barley is going to be to store. So um, low RBA numbers means that like you might have low RBA, but with high germinative energy. But if you come back in a month or two or three and you want to malt that grain, you're not going to find that high germinative energy anymore because it's active and um, having been sprouted off the field. So you can malt it right away, but it's not going to store very long. And storage is really key um, for any malt house, but especially for smaller rat maltsters. Um, <clears throat> so that's what I have uh, as far as slides and, and nerdy number stuff goes. Um, so um, Brooke, would you like to roll that footage? Yes. So hi, my name is uh, Christian Cap, and I am the research uh, technician here at UPREC. Um, right now we are standing in the grain quality uh, lab that we uh, were fortunate enough to be able to put together with help from an MDAR grant back um, in 2016. Um, so that's how long we've been in um, 
business, so to speak. And so we, we test grain quality on malting barley, wheat, oats, uh, rye, and we're currently um, thinking about expanding into possibly other crops such as corn um, and specifically concentrating on the mycotoxin aspect of, of the test. So, but we started out as a malting barley lab and so when, let's say, you, the grower, wants to send a sample into our lab, um, our complete sample would be germination energy, uh, which just shows how, how viable your lot of barley is at that moment in time for sprouting. Germination capacity, which tells, that number tells us how the capacity of your barley to germinate. So, then we test for crude protein, kernel assortment, uh, moisture, pre-harvest sprout, and uh, Don, which would be deoxy and valenol. Um, so basically, when your sample comes into the lab, we log it in Google Drive, we then assign a number to it, it goes into a quart size mason jar um, and that's its home for at least six months to a year if not longer um, and the sample is lightly cleaned through our um, cleaning mill and that's really just to get the beards off of the barley and then after our sample is clean we run it through our seed counter because we have to count out um, seeds for our germination energy and our germination capacity test. And so we just count out 100 seeds per plate on the germination energy test. So we'll run a four mil test, plate A and B, and an eight mil test, plate C and D. And what those tests tell us then is how viable the barley is in terms of germination and then how water sensitive it is. So we run everything through our seed counter and then we put it either in a plate or a beaker and then we would move on to crude protein, kernel assortment and our other assorted tests. We're running about seven to ten business days um, on our reporting. Um, it depends on the amount of samples we have in the lab and what else we have ongoing. Um, since this lab is basically a, a, a subset of what goes on here in terms of agronomy research, we run both private samples through our lab and we also run uh, research samples through our lab as well. Okay, so here I'm going to demonstrate our uh, seed cleaner. And right here is why we really purchased our seed cleaner, is because occasionally we'll have barley come in that has um, fawns or beards on the seed, like this. And it makes it difficult to flow through our equipment and to work with. So this seed cleaner here is a Foofer, I believe the name, I probably missed pronounce that it's a German company so there's a cylinder encased in here with wires that come off of it and the wires separate the beard from the seed so we dump it in sample in turn it on And it's a shade cleaner. So here we have our uh, machine that tests crude protein and moisture. Um, it's called a FOSS InfraTech Nova. 
it's uh, its main job is just to, uh, like I said, test recruit protein. Uh, it uses reflectance um, as a way to test for that, and I will let Ryan Hamilton explain that later on in this video. Um, so what we do when we test for crude protein, this machine is uh, real, very simple to, it's very complex um, internally when you look at the programming, but it's very simple to use just to, um, in order to complete your analysis. So we take our sample and we pour it in the uh, little container catch pan here. Now this container catch pan has a conveyor belt, so you'll see in a minute how that operates. So, once your sample's poured in, you come down and press this button. Now it wants our sample number. We've already tested this sample, so we're just going to type in gibberish and say OK. Now right now what the machine is doing, it is taking a subsample of this sample itself. It will take nine of these subsamples. machine. I've actually um, tested the moisture with our Dickey John grain computer and this is actually more accurate than our grain computer. And that's it. Record your, um, the machine will also record your uh, data to its uh, internal hard drive but we also like to instantly record this on our Google Sheets because we use Google Docs for all of our lab-based um, data management and data capture. And then if you really want to get nerdy, you can go into, I think, the details of your sample and it will show you the subsample, protein and moisture, and then it also gives standard deviation, which is a very important statistic in lab in lab analysis and then it just gives you your min and your max. Okay so here we have our RVA Starch Mastery 2 manufactured by Purton. What this machine tells us is whether or not our barley has uh, any pre-harvest uh, sprout or germination within the seed. Um, and it does this based on the viscosity of our sample. So we weigh out uh, a certain amount of ground barley sample, place it in this canister, add 25 milliliters of distilled water, stir just a little bit, so we get the clumps stirred up. Insert our paddle. Now the machine has to heat up to 95 degrees centigrade. And then it starts its test. And right now it's measuring the viscosity of the sample based on certain revolutions per minute and certain temperatures. And it's a three minute test.
So here's what our sample looks like. And so that's what the machine was testing is how viscous this ground up barley was. And as you can see, this one is viscous, which actually correlates well to pre-harvest sprout. If it's thinner, it seems that there's more of a higher chance for sprout. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you, Brooke. Um, <clears throat> so Christian's here with us today. And um, if anyone has any questions about lab services or, or that video, which was beautifully shot by myself, um, uh, he's here to answer any questions we may have. Um, <clears throat> so I have one right off the bat. Um, what are raw grain analysis fees right now um, for just kind of like the standard panel uh, up there? Right now we are currently in flux due to COVID-19. So our uh, website and our feeds fee schedule is was due to change uh, probably in May of this year, 2020, maybe August. But with COVID-19 uh, happening, then of course, as we all know, everything shifted towards the pandemic. And so right now our, our, our pricing, I believe, is still the same as it is on our website. I believe we're $50 for a complete sample, but we'll run anything that you want us to run. Um, if you just want a crude protein or if you just want a assortment or if you want germination, uh, we can break it down via test, even though that is not on the website. Did that answer your, nice. go ahead, Ryan. Um, Oh yeah, yeah, that answers my question. Um, and one thing I think is great to point out too um, is that you run your analyses like in triplicate, right? For statistic, like statistical robustness. Is that a word, robustness? Yes, robustness. Everything is duplicated, yep. <laughs> um, nice. The uh, RV, we run two tests um, per sample on RVA and two tests per sample for both four milliliter and eight milliliter tests. But then we'll also take a look at the standard deviation between those two. And so then if the standard deviation is high, we will rerun. And usually that happens more with the RVA than it does with germination. But sometimes it happens with germination as well. You'll have one plate that reads 90% and you'll have one plate that reads 75%. I can't explain that otherwise than possibly sampling procedure but yeah. it's uncommon that um, that happens that's good um but yeah i mean if it was there was any doubt you just have to rerun run the analysis over and over and over again and eventually it would return to an accurate mean hopefully exactly uh yeah um so while i got me on the line here um calypso shows some really weird numbers right off the field for germinative capacity. Can you tell us about that? Because I think it's really important that growers growing Calypso and maltsters accepting samples into their lab know more about the context behind those weird, unexpected GC numbers. How much time do I have? Uh, I don't know, as much as you need, I guess. Okay. Um, <laughs> So I'll actually back up and uh, go back to when we were testing, when we first started testing barley growing in the state of Michigan, we noticed that a lot of the lines that had been bred or developed in North America seemed to have a higher propensity for sprout, which makes sense because these lines are bred to come off the field and go directly into the malt house. The, the, Maltsters did not want any dormancy at all due to a possibility of barley ending stocks being very low, right? No one wants anyone to run out of their beer, which by the way, I want to thank everyone for attending our virtual happy hour. And unfortunately, we do not have any um, virtual well drinks, but we do have free advice. So I wanted to say thank you for attending before I forgot. So getting back on to pre-harvest sprouting Calypso. So we learned that varieties from the United Kingdom, we were fortunate enough to have a partnership with Lima Grain, 
Lima Grain is the third largest seed company in the world and they're owned by French farmers. So they have a lot of access to European genetics, uh, German genetics. So when you take a look at the history of barley, you had some barley land raised varieties come from the United Kingdom, from Germany, Slovenia, Slovakia. And I think that those were all held on to and those were the heritage varieties that were brought over to Michigan and so those had high uh, dormancy. And so it seems like the varieties out of the United Kingdom or out of the EU have higher dormancies when we put them in Michigan's climate, which is good for pre-harvest sprout when we run into a wet year. But as we've noticed on the winter crop, the winter crop can come off earlier before the rains. And so we're looking at something like LCS Calypso, which is a great barley but it has dormancy or high dormancy at harvest. So if you were to harvest it and want to malt it, you would, at what, we have like 30% in germ, I think, after harvest on Calypso. We don't have any statistical research to show how dormant it is after harvest, but it is definitely dormant. And I've heard it from other parts of, I think New York experiences the same problem, Pennsylvania. So did that answer your question, Ryan? Yes, absolutely. I was on mute and typing in the chat. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so Tom actually asked, um, so what are most farmers growing for malt barley in Michigan? Um, we're in Ohio and have specified Scala, but some folks in our latitude are growing Violetta. What's the best winter barley for the Midwest for both farmers and maltsters? Like, I wish I knew that. <laughs> but we, uh, we like Calypso a lot up here um, and that's not just because of that dormancy thing. Um, I think that's something that needs to be like negotiated um, because it could be problematic for storage reasons. But, um, but it seems to be really winter hardy, especially compared to Violetta. Uh, for us, Scala did pretty well up here too, but I think um, Brooke and, well, yeah, um, Brooke and or uh, Christian, you could probably talk about why maybe Scala wasn't as good a choice as Calypso. Uh, I guess Brooke would have, Brooke would be better suited agronomically. I just want to mention the, the, the Calypso dormancy, just to revisit that. You know, that, that's also something, Ryan, that you alluded, alluded to in your first slide, right? And that you want to work out a relationship with your maltster. And so that's where you, if, if your maltster wants you to grow Calypso, then you just let them know that, well, this probably won't germinate or it won't be at 90% for maybe six months. Yeah. And then between Calypso and Scala, I think on the quality standards that I've seen, they're pretty, or they're, they're about the same. But I'll turn it over to Brooke now. Yeah, um, Scala, we have had quite a few winter hardiness issues. And it's not just that it always die or it dies in the winter, but we've also seen some funny growth habits like delayed maturity if it co doesn't come out of the winter very well. Um, when it does grow well, uh, it produces really good barley in most cases. So I think that um, there's not one greatest um, variety. I think there's a lot of the varieties primarily that have been bred in Europe because that's where most winter barleys come from that we have. Um, but there are some U.S. breeders now working on it. Can be really grown and, and can produce really good quality barley, both for the farmer and for the maltster. But I think that every one of them, we need to know what we're up against and what our goals are. And I think that, because you can get wildly different results for the same variety, but grown on two different farms. And so that's why I think it, it's, it really is a, a fun um, crop to work with because there's so many variables and, and, and you can get really good quality from lots of different varieties, but also really bad quality too. <laughs> Yeah, there was a particular grower that I was working with over in the thumbs, like the tip of the thumb, uh, Kindy, and he had great success with Wint Malt, Scala, um, and I want to say Calypso, but um, so varieties that have been problematic in other regions of the state, like he had really great success and like phenomenal yields with, but I think that's just due to his environment over there. 
Um, same thing with uh, a guy named Gary West and Crowswell. Um, he had really great luck with Synergy, which is a spring barley, um, but really high alpha amylase, really low dormancy. Like it should be like destroyed from sprout, but he successfully grew it two different seasons. So um, the proof is in the pudding, really. Um, you can say something's not a great choice, but you know, at the end of the heart, end of the growing year, if you get a beautiful harvest and get sound barley out of it, who am I to complain? Um, but Michigan is so diverse climatically, um, like so many different microclimates. Um, and we're very different up here than Ohio and Indiana. Um, so there was years where there was like flooding, like terrible flooding and storm systems coming through where um, like barley just had a terrible time in Indiana and Ohio. And um, like Caleb Mashalki and then some of the other monsters um, in, in Ohio as well were looking for barley from us um, because they didn't get anything that was really usable in significant quantities. Um, so yeah, and thankfully we have a community that can rely on each other for those kind of things too. Um, so hopefully that answers kind of your, your question, Tom. <laughs> good as it can be answered i guess that you guys are in the same boat that we are that uh <clears throat> there is no good answer and it depends year to year as to what's going to grow well as i said you know we basically specify scala simply because it's you know the, the folks in new york state uh, and you know everybody from penn state and cornell and uh you know the field trials have always gone well with scala uh, but we're considering Violetta, you know, at least for a test for next year. And, uh, but we've, we've had good luck with Scala. We're going to stick with it for the time being. Awesome. Um, yeah, it, it produced great barley up here when it did. Um, yeah, I think most of the problems that we saw were like um, in our research fields and everything. So those are good places to have problems like that. I think um, pretty much everybody in New York State is growing Scala. I mean, I, I haven't run into a farmer up there who's growing malting barley that's not growing Scala. Yeah, I've heard negative opinions about Calypso up there too. Um, and Odyssey, which is our top pick for spring two row. Odyssey is great here, um, but not so good in, in New York. Um, so it looks like we're running long on time, which is good, um, keeping the conversation going. But I, um, I wanted to um, introduce Rebecca Jennings from Oregon Malt and uh, make sure that we got time to chat with her. So speaking of malting community, uh, welcome, Rebecca. Thank you for being here with us. Um, how are things going? No problem. It's good. How are you? Doing well. It's a little blustery and fall-like up here. <laughs> here as well. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so how's, how was harvest for, um, for origin? How is, how's the pulpin doing this year? Um, it's, it's doing, um, well, um, it's been harvested, um, come off the fields, um, in the timing that we would like to see, um, puffin is a little bit earlier in maturity, so it comes off, um, relatively June timeframe. Um, and depending on geographical location, will determine uh, obviously when it comes off. But um, yeah, it it looked good. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I had like a ton of questions that I wanted to ask you, and I'm completely drawing a blank right now. But um, <laughs> so <laughs> like, um, what uh like what do you think aside from like obviously communication <laughs> that i like hammered into everybody's uh screens today uh what do you think is like the most important thing or maybe a top three important things um that growers and maltsters need to know in order to be successful together um like you said communication is a is a key um but also understanding the variability that the crop will will present to you i mean you guys all mentioned um barley especially a winter variety is definitely subject to environmental uh impacts um depending on where you live and where you're growing um but the 
the the important the important thing is not to give up <laughs> just because you you might have a bad year one year um, doesn't mean the next year is going to present the same thing. Um, each year is going to present new challenges for for growers and maltsters. Um, but working together and figuring out how we can make barley um, make barley work for all parties, including the brewer. Right? That's the that's the important piece is making sure the barley that comes off your field is usable for a brewer. Um, so going through the quality lab, getting those analyses and understanding those analyses is key for a grower. Because if the grower doesn't understand what each of those parameters means or what those parameters do for the final customer, which is the brewer or the distiller, um, then it, it there might be some confusion if there are contracts, because you mentioned earlier in your presentation, if you have a contract, you more or less have an outlet, but that's not always the case if it doesn't meet those quality parameters. So those quality parameters and understanding them um, and, and understanding the final outcome of what those mean is, is crucial. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, and as far as like communicating about everything, I forgot about that part, like the actual understanding <laughs> part. Um, hey, Ryan, I have a question. I just switch sure. over to my phone, but can, can Rebecca or I'm sure you can, or anybody else that wants to jump in, explain why high protein is bad? Yeah, <laughs> uh, there's a couple of reasons high protein is bad. One, it's um, it's bad for the maltster. And then second, it is bad for the brewer. So for the maltster, the higher the protein, um, the less fermentable sugars that there are in the barley in order to, um, to produce alcohol. Um, and typically the higher the protein, the lower your plump. Um, and with the higher protein, the barley takes in the malt house, the barley takes up water very, very quickly. Um, so germination can happen very quickly and you can end up with over modified malt if your proteins are too high. Um, it also, higher protein also produces higher enzymes. So in the distilling world, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, for distilling, you typically look for higher protein material, higher protein barley, um, in order to produce those enzymes because they're using it as, um, they're using those enzymes to convert the corns and the rices um, and any other type of material that they're using that isn't malted or um doesn't have simple sugars. In the brewing world, high protein can lead to foam instability. It can lead to um, grind issues. So as I mentioned, the higher the protein, typically the smaller the kernels. Um, those smaller kernels may require a mill set difference. Um, if you have a wet mill, it can cause all kinds of problems because you don't want to pulverize the grain, you just want to crack it. And that's hard to do if you have smaller kernels. Um, protein, higher protein in the brewery leads to excessive enzymes. So you might end up with more um, simple sugars, the simplest forms like glucose instead of maltose and maltotriose, which are yeast utilized the most in order to produce that alcohol. But glucose, the bar or the, the yeast will just gobble that all up and become fat, dumb, and happy way too soon and not typically give you uh, your final alcohol volume that you're looking for. It's a long answer, sorry. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, <clears throat> I've got a question. Sure. How you guys doing now? This is Trevor at One Well Brewing. Just from a brewer's perspective, this is a great uh, Zoom call and I thank you for all your knowledge. Well, thank you, Trevor. Good to hear from you. Yeah, hey Ryan. Um, 
you know, I'm not sure if this is just a, a joke everyone's talking about here, but do you see the Michigan, um, you know, malt industry growing this next year with California wildflower, wildflowers, um, for, well, excuse me, wildfires uh, producing smoke malt for everyone that's out there? Uh, maybe Oregon might not be affected, but just wanted to chime in on that. Kind of a weird, weird thing. Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, and it's not just California. Um, Colorado is on fire. Right. Uh, Oregon, yeah. Yep. Um, it's yeah. I mean, everything's connected, and it it makes a great case for lo- relocalizing supply chains. That's for sure. Right. Um, Idaho. I have, I have a. a big, go ahead. I, I I guess my thought is absolutely like we are in a region and we can produce great barley. We just Unfortunately, we need an opportunity and you don't want something bad to be, you know, on on the flip side to be that opportunity. But I'm convinced that we can grow the barley that's needed, you know, for the brewing industry. We just we just need that chance. Right. So do you do you think anyone on the West is having issues with uh, the smoke affecting the product for either the maltster grower you know, and then later down the line, it's going to affect us brewers. I don't know. Um, I probably okay. depends somewhat right. on okay. the season, the seasonality of when the grain is ripening and if it's still in the field at that time. But I'm I'm not connected to the exact story, so I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Right Early acres in depends. California. Go ahead. I think it depends on geographically where the malt's coming from as well. Um, your barley acres in in California are fairly low. Um, most of the maltsters in those are, are in Oregon um, or Washington. Their barley is coming from further east um, and being right. brought in. Right. There's th- so I think it just depends on geographically where they're located, um, whether or not it's going to affect um, the uptake of that smoke during um yep. during ripening as as brooke said so cool thanks for trying to answer the question guys appreciate it <laughs> thank you trevor yeah cheers cheers man all right um so yeah uh, let's open it up for questions um if if anybody else has questions well uh, i definitely forgot my toast um, so I've gotten kind of out of order this week. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to toast everyone who is on this call. We have a nice crowd of folks and I think we've had like really good engagement. Um, we went way over time, which to my mind is a good thing. Um, so cheers to everyone here. Um, you're awesome and happy fall. Cheers, Ryan. Ryan, I'm sending you a virtual uh, old duels. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I also have my quart mason jar of not vodka with me. There you go. Can I tell the quick story of the bottle that I had before? Yeah, absolutely. So I had this bottle and I had to leave my office and I can't drink and drive, which, you know, at the same time. Um, it was made by a friend who took some Spartan barley, actually, which has all kinds of grain quality issues that we know about, but um, and mixed it with some heritage wheat that was grown through a ministry of the Episcopal Church in West Michigan and made, and I can't even remember the style, um, but fun stories like that are creeping in, and I tend to cherish every like little little thing like that that uh, includes. Um, stories and unique aspects of what we're trying to do. So cheers with that from a blank screen on your end. Oh, well, I can see your name. So cheers. <laughs> um, so I'm going to guess maybe it was a grisette if it was using a lot of unmalted wheat or maybe a wit beer. But... Yeah, one of those two probably. <laughs> Um, yeah, super cool story, um, and kudos to them for hand harvesting that wheat with scythes. That's like, that's really, really going for it. Right. 
Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, if we don't have any further questions, um, next week is uh, malt quality analysis week. So uh, barring any unforeseen catastrophes, I think Christian will be joining us again for that. Um, we'll also have uh, Mr. Aaron McLeod from the Hartwick College Center for Craft Food and Food and Beverage joining in. And I don't have the list in front of me, but I think we have another guest as well. Um, thank you again for everyone, uh, to everyone for showing up for this. Um, it's been a really fun conversation. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, uh, the Michigan Brewers Guild, uh, Craft Beverage Council, Michigan Barley, and the Michigan Crop Improvement Association. I just said Michigan like 10 times. <laughs> Thanks everyone. And I uh, hope you have a great weekend and cheers. <laughs>